I'm Carrie Weber, for those of you I don't know. I'm the executive director of the Fairfield University Art Museum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. We are so excited to be celebrating the opening of Norma Minkowitz, Body to Soul, uh, this evening, and we're glad you're here with us. Um, before we get to the main event, um, our lecture this evening, I want to just make a few announcements and a few thank yous. Um, announcements, in case you don't know, we have another fabulous exhibition that opened last week in the Walsh Gallery. It's called Women's Rights or Human Rights, and it's an international poster exhibition. Um, we had a great group there last week. Some of you were there. Um, I encourage you to check it out. It's um, People are really enjoying the exhibition and finding it um, very stimulating, I would say. Something about the bold graphic of the posters um, is, a, is a nice change from some of the other things we've shown. Um, and uh, I want to acknowledge and thank our faculty liaison for this exhibition, uh, Joe Yarrington, Associate Professor of Studio Art. I want to thank uh, Tom Grada and Rhonda Brown. I, I don't think they're here yet, unfortunately, stuck in traffic perhaps, um, of Brown Grada Arts for their collegial collaboration on this exhibition. We're very grateful to our lenders, the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, and uh, several private collectors for their important loans to the exhibition. And this evening's lecture is made possible by the Robert Lehman Foundation. It is part of the Edwin L. Wiesel Jr. Lectureships in Art History. Finally, and most importantly, I would like to thank Norma Minkowitz for helping us to make this exhibition all that it could be. None of this would have been possible, Norma, without your enthusiastic participation, so thank you. Um, as always, I would like to thank our small but mighty museum team, team and to thank my colleagues for all of their help in bringing this exhibition to life. Michelle DeMarzo, Curator of Education and Academic Engagement, Megan Pacwa, Museum Registrar, and Rosalinda Rodriguez, our Museum Assistant. And we are so pleased to have the continued collaboration of our colleague, Dr. Laura Gasca, in the Modern Languages and Literatures Department, and are very grateful for the Spanish language translations she provides that allow us to present almost all of our exhibition materials bilingually in Spanish. Turns out she's a fantastic copy editor, too, so we get a little added bonus for our translation fees. Uh, before we move on, I want to take just a moment to introduce the museum's newest team member, uh, to all of you so she can say a few words. Please welcome Marie-Laure Cougel, our new Director of Development for Fairfield Arts. Good evening, everybody. So nice to see you. Um, if you follow our news, um, I'm sure you know all about the incredible arts offerings here at Fairfield University, from free exhibitions and uh, cultural programs in our Better Mind and Walsh galleries to uh, amazing performances and lectures down the road at the Quick Center. All these programs support um, and complement the experience and the work of our students and faculty and help us create community through the arts. So this is what Fairfield Arts is all about, about uniting and elevating the arts um, on our campus and beyond and celebrating Fairfield University's uh, presence and role as a destination for arts and culture. Um, I also wanted to thank um, all of you in the room who have contributed to our annual fund. I know many of you have, so thank you so much for your generosity. We truly appreciate it. Um, the Fairfield University Art Museum offers 60 programs and up to seven exhibitions annually. As you know, our programs are always free, always accessible online and in person, and as Carrie mentioned, accessible in both English and Spanish. So we're very proud of our commitment uh, to excellence and access, but of course, all of this is only possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, members, and visitors like you. So, um, you know, again, thank you if you have already made a gift, if you haven't yet, and would like to join us in, you know, supporting our programs and all of our efforts around the arts. If you enjoy our exhibitions and programs and believe in the power of the arts, I hope that you will consider um, using the donation card that is in your catalog to make a gift tonight. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and the reception. Thank you. Now, without further ado, please let me introduce our speaker and the 
curator of the exhibition, which you will get to see shortly downstairs, Dr. Sarah Parrish. Dr. Parrish was a pleasure to work with, and we are so pleased that we were able to bring her vision for this exhibition and for the catalog to fruition. We are extremely grateful for her efforts. Sarah Parrish holds a PhD from Boston University and is currently Assistant Professor of Art History at Plymouth State University, New Hampshire. Specializing in contemporary American fiber art, she served as the Andrew W. Mellon funded Curatorial Research Fellow and Catalog Author for the Institute of Contempor Contemporary Art Boston's landmark textile exhibition, Fiber, Sculpture 1960 to Present. Her writing on 20th century craft also appears in Art Papers magazine, The Burlington Magazine, Baden's Vitamin T, Threads and Textiles in Contemporary Art, and the peer-reviewed Journal of Design and Culture. She is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Connections Grant and was named the American Craft Council's Emerging Voices Scholar in 2017. Please welcome Sarah Parrish. Thank you, and I have to offer a few thank yous of my own. Thank you so much to Carrie Weber and your whole team. At this day and age, it's so rare to find um, professional leaders who are just so supportive of every um, crazy idea that one might have and that are so good at what they do. And that same could be said of Norma um, Minkowitz. Thank you so much for trusting me with your art. It's a huge responsibility, um, and it was just a pleasure to be able to engage with it on a deeper level. And that's exactly what I would like to do today, is engage with her work on the kind of deep level that it calls for. Um, I wanted to start off our talk tonight the same way that Norma Minkowitz starts off all of her work. With a piece of string. Um, it's hard to imagine that every phenomenal piece that you see downstairs, whether it is a figure, whether it's an abstraction, even if it's a drawing, it starts with a single Thread. And of course, this is an exaggerated thread. Uh, this is comically exaggerated, actually. Norma prides herself on using the finest possible threads uh, to create really intricate, um, intricate effects in her work. So I just did this for those of you on Zoom and those of you in the nosebleed back here. But it's really amazing that even the drawings, we can think of this as a line in space. And there's a real crossover between Minkowitz's drawings and her textile practice and seeing the fiber as a kind of line that is drawn in space. Um, and I wanted to begin with this, this thread because it's foundational to understanding what makes her art different from so much of the work that we look at. Um, when I held this up, it's something you probably were surprised to see in an art museum, um, maybe perhaps surprised to see in this grand setting with the mahogany walls and plaster ceilings. Um, but all of you are wearing it to some degree. Uh, we have an intimate connection with textiles throughout our whole lives, um, from when we're first born and are swaddled in textiles as a baby, um, to wearing it as our protective or expressive uh, outerwear that we use to present ourselves to the world, even to many cultures being shrouded in death in a textile. We have such an intimate relationship to threads, to this material, that we don't necessarily have to, say, uh, oil paint that you see on the wall over there, or marble sculptures that you might see in a museum. When we see something that's made out of fiber, we connect to it on that very close embodied level because we're so used to its softness and having it next to our skin. Many of you may have also even crocheted it or knitted it so you know how much work and effort and skill go into transforming this simple line into something that is functional like a sweater or even beautiful. And taking that to the next level, Norma, it's amazing how she's able to imagine the possibilities in this simple, humble thread and create things from her imagination that connect so closely to our lives, our bodies, and our dreams. Um, so one of the challenges with a solo exhibition is that you get to go really deep, well, not a challenge, an opportunity is that you get to go so deep into an artist's practice and look at it from so many different angles. Uh, but a challenge is that you lose some of the breadth surrounding the work, that 
You don't get to see necessarily how that artist relates to other artists, how they might relate to um, kind of broader social and political situations that are maybe touched on or spoken to in their art, um, but exist outside of it. So what I'd like to do today is um, add to some of the many contexts and associations that you might be bringing to this material and um, add some contexts that may be less familiar to you, but that help us better understand what Norma's doing and why it's so important and unlike what anyone else is doing. So to begin, I'm, uh, I've begun the exhibition with this work. So when you go downstairs in the hall, you will, a little sneak preview here, uh, will be flanked on either side with sequence on the right and a portrait on her, your left. And as we move through the themes that I'm going to guide you through today, we'll also kind of be moving around the exhibition. So we're beginning with themes of fiber on the right and material, um, exploring some other themes in the exhibition, and then returning to close out our time together with her self-portrait. Um, but this work, here, um, I begin with this because it shows, in a way, to those of you who don't get to see my cool little fiber trick up here, um, it shows the, um, the material that's the basis of everything that comes on later in the show. But it wasn't always the case that art made from fabric, thread, um, rope, string, that's what I mean when I use the term fiber in this context, it wasn't always the case that that was taken seriously as fine art. For a long time, it was excluded from art museums, perhaps due to its association with women's production or um, the deep traditions of fiber from communities of color. Um, but in the 1960s and 1970s, so right before Norma hit the scene, there was a big change and a big renaissance in fiber in the United States. So museums, like the Museum of Modern Art that you see on the lower left, mounted an exhibition called Wall Hangings with works by Sheila Hicks and Lenore Tani. You can see some of those there. And Mildred Constantine and Jack Lenore Larson published a really influential book, Beyond Craft, The Art Fabric, saying that this is not just craft, we're going beyond craft and what artists are doing with fiber, thread, and other soft materials should be seen as art. So we're now having in the United States frameworks for understanding um, work made from fiber as fine art, and that kind of paved the way for Norma to be able to do that in her own practice and very early works like this one, the earliest one in the exhibition, Around and Around. Um, so here, the softness that you might be perceiving as I've been dangling this thread in front of you uh, is on full display as the threads are both crocheted and then woven together and interlaced together, topped by a, a circle of figures who are embracing one another in solidarity. Um, so this is uh, largely possible because of the earlier generation that's doing this, and Norma was participating in that early uh, wave of activity of using fiber as fine art to make something that is expressive, that's making a statement, and that is beautiful and goes beyond its pure function. Um, there's a quote by Ani Albers that I'll just paraphrase, um, a famous Bauhaus artist working with fiber, um, but she talks about uh, letting threads um, be what she calls pictorial threads, that their only purpose is to be beautiful and to make an expression and not necessarily to be used as a glove or a mitten or a scarf. Although those, those things, of course, can be beautiful as well. Um, so this moment, uh, this early moment here of the 60s and 70s when art was... Uh, or when fiber was entering the art world, it was a period of great promise. Um, but it ultimately didn't take as much hold as uh, one would have hoped. And a lot of the artists working in this vein uh, got overlooked, but then were the subject of a uh, recent resurgence of scholarship and exhibitions worldwide. I'm just showing you some largely kind of American examples here, um, but in exhibitions, in scholarly publications, in kind of the early 2010s. Uh, so fiber, sculpture, 1960 to present, 
I was a research assistant for that, um, and that was at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, um, looking at some of these earlier fiber artists from the 60s and 70s, vitamin T, threads and textiles, um, Alyssa Author's book, um, which predated the ICA exhibition, string felt thread, the hierarchy of art and a craft in America. Um, but there's a glaring omission from all of these. And full disclosure, I actually worked on some of these publications and I have to look back and say, what were we thinking? Because Norma Minkowitz doesn't appear in these works. Um, so when I started curating this, I first question was what was I thinking? And, but second question is why is that? Why in the, the midst of this renewed attention to this work um, was her work so unique and so distinct that our brains that had now opened up a little bit to be able to let fiber in still hadn't opened up enough to really understand the true impact of what she was doing. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how her work relates to some of uh, the work that was being made at the same time as what she was doing, as well as slightly before and kind of set the, the ground for, for the discussions of art and fiber. Um, so if you look at everything on the screen, you might notice that not only Norma Minkowitz is missing, but figures in general, figurative work. This is all entirely abstract. So there was a belief kind of at the time, a prevailing belief that if you wanted to kind of get into the fine art world, you had to speak the language of abstraction, right? And um, that figures or um, imagery might distract from that because it wasn't as popular in the mainstream art world at that time. Um, so Norma's work is so powerful and so figurative. Even the title, Body to Soul, signals that right away of our exhibition. Um, so fi her figurative focus set her apart from her peers, and she was doing something no one else was. Um, there's also, in just her very approach itself, not even subject matter, but the approach itself, she's been doing something that's so different from so many fiber artists. Uh, Mimi Shore, reviewing one of those early exhibitions, said, most fiber art exploits the expressive potential of fiber itself, playing up the hairiness of rope, emphasizing the sleekness of plastic yarns, or revealing unexpected qualities in wool. Um, so to quote Al Annie, Annie Albers again, threads should kind of determine their own destiny, that uh, they expected artists to think about what thread does. Okay, it kind of flops, it's soft, it can be piled up. Right, and to amplify that. And that's exactly what works like uh, Sheila Hicks's Banisteriopsis here do. Um, I'm just gonna, sorry, I'll go back to that. Uh, but, uh, but Norma Minkowitz's Goodbye Goddess, for example, her approach is very different because she, compared to, say, Sheila Hicks, is using those very, very fine fibers and crocheting them, often starting around an object, a found object, such as um, a doll. Those were her very earliest influences, was kind of crocheting around a doll head um, that sometimes kept in. You'll see some found objects inside the artworks downstairs that's sometimes removed later so that there's a shell. But then something that we think about as being very soft she hardens with resin or shellac, a clear coating that makes it very stiff and heavy, kind of the opposite of what you would expect fiber to do in its raw kind of soft state. Um, so very different from uh, someone like Sheila Hicks's pile here where it's figurative, it's hard instead of soft, and instead of letting the fibers fulfill their own destiny and kind of do their own thing, here she's shaping them to her vision and creating something that you would never expect to be able to be made from fiber, these goddess statues. We usually think of a classical goddess as um, something that's made from marble. And when you go downstairs, you'll see that these have that same hard, stiff, rigid quality of marble while also retaining that softness. And there's almost kind of a visual pun that's happening in the background with this sweep of drapery that looks so soft and responding to gravity, just like my thread here, uh, but is actually very hard and rigid. So there's, her work is full of these contradictions where when you think something should be soft, it's actually hard. Or where you think you're looking at the inside of something, you're actually looking at the outside and vice versa. Um, I see some people at the doorway. If you want to come in and find a seat, then um, we'd be welcome to have you. Give people a chance to get settled.
Great, so uh, now I'm returning to that hamburger you were all laughing at what that I sped past. Um, but yet another way that Norma Minkowitz uh, transcends what other artists were doing at the time is that I just mentioned uh, the term gravity, that here this drape looks like it's kind of responding to gravity, that it's hanging, when in reality it's, it's stiff and fixed and frozen. Here, Sheila Hicks's work, is, it's flopping down on the floor. Where else uh, can you emphasize more that something's responding to gravity than on the floor? Because that's kind of where everything goes, right? Um, uh, but so when people talked about fiber art or even art that was making it kind of more into the mainstream, like Robert Morris's belt pieces, which also could be considered as fiber art, but they weren't called that, or Clay Oltenberg's floor burger, that soft sculpture too, um, they, critics and artists were really interested in those qualities of kind of following gravity. And they talked about them in terms of the body, that this is a cheeseburger or a burger, a hamburger, but um, there's something that reminds us of our own flesh here, our own bodies, that it, um, our own bodies respond to gravity, whether we like it or not. Um, they degrade, they degrade, you know, our bodies degrade, um, just like these soft sculptures uh, often can degrade. Um, so people are really talking about this soft sculpture, both inside and outside of fiber circles, as um, a stand-in or a metaphor for the body, for flesh. Um, but when you think about uh, Norma Minkowitz's work, um, I want to I want to bring another metaphor into the mix, a different metaphor. She's looking at bodies, she's looking at figures, but I'm not sure if flesh, if the kind of physical muscle and meat of the body, is what she's really after in these works. Um, instead, the way that she very delicately crochets and then applies resin over it. Uh, to harden it, creates a kind of shell that could be thought of more as a skin. Um, we can look at uh, this close-up of Body to Soul, uh, the title piece of the exhibition, and the this is a sequential work, so it moves uh, in series, and we can imagine as we move from one side to the next, this is the same being transforming along their journey. journey. Um, so if we look at just one iteration, the one that's closest to us, the foreground in the camera, um, we can see through it. it. We can see a kind of skin that we can imagine wrapping, but we can also look through and see inside um, what's happening. And so her very open weave allows us to do that. Her use of resin, which she shares with an artist um, like Ava Hessa, who also uses these kind of hardening agents to freeze her string and make them kind of brittle. Um, it could be thought of more as skin as well. Um, but those hardening agents, the, uh, the resin, the shellac, um, they also make it tough and strong. Um, so there's a really it's a really kind of interesting way that she's invoking skin there, but also perhaps bone or um, the rigor mortis of your skin when um, it hardens and um, and is fixed after death. Here in this series, her association with skin becomes quite literal when she's using, um, actually not skin, this is actually hog gut, um, but it's another one of those visual tricks that she performs that um, we imagine these as kind of a stretched vellum or a stretched animal skin. Uh, when we don't kind of think of them as the innards and the inside. So it's weird because even though she's using the guts of the animal, you're, you're thinking of it perhaps more in terms of what we'd more associate with a skin or a vellum or a hide. Um, and that association with the body becomes so literal because she's using actual kind of animal bodily elements in her work. Um, those contradictions that I mentioned where you think you're looking at one thing but you're really looking at another are so pronounced in this series. Um, this is again taken from the exhibition downstairs uh, because I think you might have been a little startled. There was a visceral like, whoa, um, when I said hog gut, because these are so beautiful. Uh, the centerpiece in the middle, uh, you look at it and it's almost like a pearl, this string that's in encased in hog gut. It looks like the pearl in the middle of an oyster. Um, it looks like a precious treasure in um, 
in a fancy vessel. Um, over on the right, wrapped, these spindles and spools, they look like they're, um, you know, a sundial. And you can even look at some earlier examples of metalwork in the same sight line that you're looking at these. So these look like rich luxury objects, even though they're made out of this material that we might think of as quite disgusting. Um, also, if we move over to the far left, um, black hole, there's a real confusion of inside to outside. Um, the outside of the vessel kind of turns inwards and becomes the inside of the black hole. So inside and outside are confused, also in the sense that we can look through the hog gut, it's translucent, and see the stitches that are inside. Um, just like also if we think about the vessel in the center, that there's a kind of concavity, but then a convexity inside of it. So she keeps questioning materials, causing us to question materials, causing us to question things like inside and outside, both of the vessels and then by extension of our bodies. Um, and that leads us to deeper questions of, well, wait a minute, if inside isn't outside, then what, what is everything that I believe, right? I start questioning everything. So her art is very intellectual, causing us to question um, received truths and really kind of think for ourselves. Here, I mentioned, you know, I've been talking about these in the context of skin. And she draws a very direct parallel between skin and fiber or textiles because those two things are mixed in these works, that it spools on the far right that she's wrapping the gut around, um, or a ball of twine in the center um, that the skin is then encasing. So one of the reasons why we relate to fiber work differently than we do, say, oil paint or marble. Most of us don't walk around, except I know there's some studio professors and some studio students uh, streaming in. Most of us don't walk around with oil paint kind of on our hands. It's not a material we touch every day. But fiber we touch every day, and it touches our skins, so much so that it could even be seen as a stand-in for skin, that our clothes are kind of like our public skin. So these are really important works because she's drawing that connection between skin and textile so strongly and making it explicit. And OK, so if you're, if you're with me so far, if we're presuming that, then uh, there's an art historian, Julia, Julia Skelly, who's writing about work made from textiles, thread, and even clay. And she, it's called Skin Crafts, Violence, Affect, and Materiality in Global Contemporary Art. And in that, she writes her thesis, her argument is here, contemporary artists employing textiles and other craft materials are drawing on the specific qualities of these media to signify the vulnerability and resilience of skin. So it's not just important that we're making a connection between in skin and fiber. Um, a lot of artists, or some artists might do that. But these key terms, vulnerability and resilience. Vulnerability, it means that you're at risk, that um, you're, you're vulnerable, that you're open to attack or open to, uh, to influences. But then resilience means that you bounce back. Um, so these are another set of opposites, another set of contra contradictions uh, that Norma Mankiewicz reconciles and challenges in her artwork, that our skin and by extension ourselves can be both vulnerable, can be open, but also resilient and kind of can bounce back when um, we're uh, faced with uh, trauma, attacks, um, damage. So looking at that in the context of a specific work that's downstairs, Victim, um, here there is a bird which frequently recurs in across Norma's practice. You'll see several birds downstairs, and there are many more flocking through her body of work, um, but kind of perched in a very provocative spot on this figure, um, which we are asked to read as a victim. There's that vulnerability, that victimization, that um, in this suggestive spot, we are afraid for this figure, that um, her skin, this crocheted skin, um, is, is vulnerable and open to violence and attack. 
Um, But at the same time, she lifts up her head, she arches her back and stares this menace in the face, showing the resilience of the body and the resilience of skin. And so that's what's going on sort of in the subject here. But if we just look at the material itself, and this is kind of the key to understanding some of her abstract works, the material itself is both vulnerable and resilient. That thread, um, I'm not going to pick that up again, but you you stretch it, it, it bounces back. Thread is so resilient. But yet, coating it in resin in that way, it becomes quite brittle looking, um, like fragile. And the fact that we can see through this figure right into her core and that emptiness there, that's another form of fragility, of openness, of vulnerability, that she's visually open to our penetrating gaze through those crocheted holes. Um, So there's that openness as well. But then I think you'll see this when you go downstairs, you might look at these photographs and think that this work is delicate, that the holes that are making it translucent between the loops of crochet are, um, you know, making this, you know, adding to that vulnerability of the skin, the fiber as skin. But in fact, when you see downstairs, these are very strong. Um, They're impenetrable and rigid and that fiber or that um, shellac, it means business. Um, So there's almost a sense of kind of an armor. So the same material that's making her vulnerable is also making her strong. The same could be said of um, another work, Body to Soul. Here, um, the same situation where we can sort of look through those lacy, delicate, crocheted threads and uh, see into the interior, the way that the crocheted threads are both looking soft and delicate, like they're dangling, but in reality, we know that the resin has fixed them stiff and frozen. All of those things are playing into this dynamic of skin as being both vulnerable and um, resilient. The figure overall, too, is both vulnerable and resilient as we trace its progression from left to right. These, she calls them sequential works, and we're sort of asked to see this as a sequence of metamorphosis or development or evolution as we move visually from one side to the next. Um, So we have a more whole, traditionally whole, complete figure on the left. that then starts to unravel as you see the, th- the string kind of unraveling and unwinding into this orb. And as we trace that progression, this figure looks more and more vulnerable, like more and more of them is kind of wasting away and unraveling and, un- and, and being rolled into this ball, kind of losing their sense of shelf and losing, losing their shape. But if we keep following, if we stick with this journey all the way to the right, something new is born something mysterious and magical, something that looks like a sun or a moon, this kind of celestial orb that the body in the end wasn't so important, but there's this kind of heavenly globe floating above. Um, And so there's this magical metamorphosis where yes, the figure, the skin, the fiber was vulnerable. It was taken apart, but it was dismantled so that it could form something else, which is just so amazing and so magical. Um, We've looked at a couple of works that are dealing with the resin coated over uh, the the very fine crochet. And as I told you, it's really actually hard in real life, really stiff and and strong. Um, She really amplifies that in later works as we move into the early 2000s. Um, So I've been not following a strict chronology, but we've kind of been moving a bit past the present. So when we get to the early 2000s in Norma's work, um, she started to go beyond just the clear resin and smear modeling paste, almost like a kind of plaster, into the grooves of the fiber. The result, if you look at a detail here, is almost like chain mail. And then uh, once she paints it with these really smart touches of red and yellow and metallics. Uh, You might go downstairs and think you're looking at a bunch of neutrals, but then once you get really close to the work, you'll see like here, there's so many colors, there's reds, there's yellows. And the effect here is of metal, that this looks like it could be woven, but that it's chain mail, that it's a suit of armor. 
um, and it's almost kind of, kind of rusting at the edges where it get, gets red. And um, the theme of unraveling but then coming back together is also evident in the subject here, where if you look at it, she's thematizing or drawing a connection between the association of fiber and skin once again, because we're not really sure if this is a fiber, a textile, a piece of fabric that we're looking at, or a body. Um, is it somebody who's kind of under the blanket and we're just looking at the shape of them underneath the cloth? Are, have they since left and we're looking at something similar to in the Christian tradition, the Shroud of Turin, where there's kind of an imprint on this fabric? Um, or was there never really a body there at all and we're just looking at fabric that's been shaped, right? He, the figure looks at risk of kind of unraveling and flattening out, like poof, the, the blanket flattens out and the figure is gone, or that the fabric is kind of rising up into this figure. So we're once again asked to really contemplate a very, very close relationship between fiber and skin that is at once delicate, as if this figure could disappear at any moment, um, but also strong and resilient that this figure is made of armor. Um, so returning to this work, um, this is, I've, I've talked about the theme of vulnerability and resilience in relation to skin as a context for Minkowitz's work. Um, and this particular work is dealing with violence against women. Um, so when we look at the vulnerability of the figure and the skin, we might see, Norma doesn't use the term herself, but we might see a kind of feminist message. So gender is another context that we might use to understand Norma's work, but understand it in a way that's different from, but related to what other artists that might self-identify as feminist or were dealing with themes of gender and women's issues are doing. Uh, Carrie mentioned the exhibition in the Walsh Gallery, and uh, this is something I pulled from the catalog accompanying that. Um, but here, you, I forget the terms you use, Carrie, but words like um, really kind of graphic, in your face, um, there's a real literalness to posters where uh, the text tells you what to read. It tells you the message whenever text is included. Um, sometimes it can be ambiguous, but in graphic design in a poster, it's making a statement on how to read the subject against violence to women. Um, the really um, graphic sensibility, both in the terms of the subject matter, but also in the printmaking style, um, tell you what the work is about. Um, but Norma Minkumis's work, um, you won't necessarily know what the subject is unless um, you were to talk to Norma or read some of the press, press release um, information on it. Um, instead, you're kind of invited to bring your own associations um, to the work. And because we all have such an intimate connection with fiber and fabric and can associate with our skin and things that touch our skin, when we look at a fiber work like this, we're invited to draw a direct connection to it in a way that isn't literal, we're not reading a statement, we're not responding politically, but is embodied, that we see another body that's vulnerable, and we might relate that just by virtue of having bodies ourselves, um, with our own bodies and our own experiences, because we know what it's like to touch fiber, and we know what it's like to be a human and be alive. Um, so it's kind of two interesting modes of address that you can see on campus right now, one very uh, direct, um, but one that Norma's taking that's more contemplated nuanced and um, allowing you to kind of find your own way and make your own associations with the work. Um, so I invite you to explore some of those themes in the back gallery, the back of our, of our gallery downstairs, where you'll have both her earliest work, which you've already seen around and around, uh, but also some of her more recent work, work that hasn't been exhibited before, a series of feminist collages that do experiment with that more direct form of address that more graphic form of address. Um, this is kind of a fun, I've been playing Where's Waldo with some people downstairs um, to find pop culture figures that you might recognize from TV or the media. Um, and there's so many different types or what I might call archetypes um, or figures that have persisted throughout the generations and across cultures 
um, such as the, the crone or the old woman that you might see in the figure of artist Kiki Smith down at the center, or um, the Madonna, or, um, or the mother, or the queen. These are all kind of figures that exist in, in most societies, um, but she's showing how our contemporary society interprets them in a way that's really direct and challenges them and asks you to challenge and think critically about our media landscape as well. And so that goes side by side with this work Around and Around, which is from a much earlier moment of feminism um, in the back gallery, or, or is parallel to, you know, kind of made around the same time as earlier um, feminist works. And fiber, there's often a kind of knee-jerk uh, impulse to read everything that's fiber as being made out of feminist, or everything that's being made out of fiber as feminist or in terms of gender. And that's not always the case. That's why people like Sheila Hicks, um, why probably often, Norma, you're working in an abstract mode to kind of resist that and say, no, this can just be about art. Um, but sometimes art is about, um, art from fiber is about gender. And that was surely the case for many artists working in the 70s um, alongside some of those fiber artists I traced earlier uh, to reclaim fiber as a fine art that belongs in museums, but not strip away that feminine experience, um, but to say that that actually makes it more valuable because it can speak to those suppressed histories that women and people of color have historically expressed through things like fiber and quilts. Um, so you see here Judy Chicago, a very famous feminist art program working on um, the dinner party and her team of needle workers and also working in the same medium of crochet, uh, Faith Wilding up with her crocheted environment up, up top. So we can see um, with this circle potentially of women embracing in solidarity, um, some of those same associations in select pieces of normas, um, such as the earlier um, work that was made kind of part of the same wave, um, but also in some of those recent works where she still wouldn't call herself a feminist, but is uh, definitely um, inviting feminist viewers into the conversations and, and speaking very directly to us. Um, so the final context that I want to kind of offer for interpreting uh, Minkowitz's work is um, one that might surprise you if you know Norma Minkowitz, and I know a lot of her friends and family are here tonight. Um, she's so um, light and kind and optimistic, um, but her work can be very dark. And I think you'll feel that when you go into the gallery, you certainly feel that where this might almost be kind of like a vampire cape lifting up. There's sort of a gothic sensibility here. And if you kind of go through her work, uh, Child of the Night, this is not on view, but um, there's often kind of dolls or doll parts um, that might um, speak to kind of the darker sides of, uh, of being kind of a parent and, and dealing with um, children, but also um, in, uh, you know, we're kind of thinking of horror movies. Like I know some of the students zooming in right now may have seen Megan with the creepy doll that's out now. Um, or thinking about the figure of the witch, which as an archetype, to return to that term, uh, historically witches aren't necessarily evil per se. Some scholars are thinking that they're not evil, but are just resisting social norms and ostracized for that reason. So this looks like a cloak that you could imagine a very glamorous witch wearing or a sorceress. I think about kind of Mickey Mouse with his wizard cape, um, but in a much more upscale way. Um, the figures of birds of prey that are, um, you know, you think about summoning them um, and, and there's kind of a darkness and gothic sensibility there. Um, excavation, if you look very closely downstairs, there's some skulls studded onto that. And there's also skulls um, in her self-portrait. Um, so the gothic isn't just kind of a pop culture paradigm. I've drew, drawn a few uh, pop culture references there that maybe I shouldn't have, but um, it also can be thought about as a really scholarly intellectual tool into tapping into why work like Norma's that is so dark really speaks to us. Um, and Mikhail Bakhtin offers a theory for that. He says, the grotesque or gothic body, it's a body in the act of becoming. It is never finished, never completed. It is continually built, created, then builds and creates another body. Um, so thinking of things like 
Frankensteinian monsters or thinking about traditions of um, the, the carnival in, in medieval times when fools would be able to become kings and the whole social order was subverted upside down. Um, he's, he's talking about getting rid of opposites, breaking down those opposites. And that's exactly what Norma has been doing in all of her work that I've shown you. And especially this body that's becoming another body that's rebuilding another body. That's precisely what we talked about with body to soul, that it may seem grotesque or gothic that the figure is unraveling, that we have this um, uncomfortable set, sense of, of skin that is is brittle, perhaps suffering from rigor mortis, or that is wounded in some way, but then becomes something beautiful as it recreates another body. So the Gothic elements of her work are speaking to other possibilities that are normally silenced in society, but that we can really embrace the potential for kind of renewal and rediscovery and rebirth um, through works like this one. Um, so speaking of renewal and rebirth, um, Norma Minkowitz is an artist that is constantly reinventing herself. Just a visit to the back of the gallery and seeing how different some of her recent work is um, from her early wor work really shows that. I think as we've uh, seen today, we're now kind of moved through the gallery or now back at the entrance, which you'll soon be at yourself. Um, and facing those balls of fiber are a self-portrait by Norma Minkowitz that shows some of those qualities and context that we've talked about today. The idea that fiber, as she's kind of crawling through it, as I have been with my, um, my fiber here, my ball of yarn, it shows how closely fiber is to her identity and how she uses it as kind of a tool to move through the world and to explore um, things within us and outside of us in society. Um, and so I would like to end with that self-portrait and uh, invite you to go down and see it soon. Um, after some discussion, I'd be really glad to take any of your questions or thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Thank you.